1914, you can know was, was born, and I met him for the first time 50 years, 49 years ago in uh, 1965. He was still 50 uh, at that point, but he turned 51 two months later. And the way I met him was that in 1965, I had the good fortune, the great good fortune, to be a member of a group uh, of students from the University of Texas who were involved in a exchange program with the University of Chile. And uh, the way that I got into the program was that I was editing the student literary magazine at that time. Riata, also later edited uh, by Kirk Wilson, sitting right over here. And uh, so I was a graduate student at the time, and uh, they normally did not take graduate students in this program. They only took undergraduates. And so they, uh, they interviewed the students that applied. There were about 200, I think and they narrowed it down to 15, only 15 could go. So I was uh, interviewed and uh, at one point they told me, well, we never, we've never taken uh, graduate students. And I told them that's stupid uh, because the uh, editor of the student literary magazine was always a, a graduate student. Were you a graduate student, Kurt? Afterwards, uh, that wasn't true, but up to that point, they'd all been graduate students. So I told them that was stupid, and I left. I thought that was the end of that. And then I got a, a notice saying that I was among the 30, the, uh, the, the semi-finalists. And uh, so I was rooming with a guy here in Austin, and I told him, I'm going to Chile. Why else would they, <laughs> would they include me if they weren't going to? And so sure enough, I did get to go. Well, it was really life. Uh, changing for me. So I went there uh, on this uh, exchange program. It was, the, it was 1965 and I think the program started in 59. Is that right? Correct. Right. Yeah. So it was the sixth, fifth or sixth year of the program. And uh, just before uh, we left, I happened to be in, in the, what was then the undergraduate library which doesn't exist any longer. They did away with it. And I used to go there often because they had open stacks that you could just go in, whereas the main library in the tower, if you were an undergraduate, you couldn't even go into the stacks. Uh, so I, I would go there often and read uh, journals, magazines, and uh, I knew that there was a, a publication from the Methodist Church called Motive, and that they, from time to time, published poetry. So I would always check that magazine to see it was a new issue and see what poetry was in there. And it just so happened, before we left, a few weeks, maybe a month, I went in there and looked in uh, Motive Magazine, and there was an article called Poetry and Politics in Chile. And uh, this is an illustration by a uh, Chilean artist, Guillermo Nunez, and uh, this was an article by Miller Williams, a poet at uh, University of Arkansas, who helped start the University of Arkansas Press, which published, has published lots of poetry. Uh, and so he talked about the new poetry, and then uh, he had translations of uh, a number of the poets. Uh, this one was Miguel Arteche, and then he did uh, Porky Tellier, <clears throat> Armando Uribe Arce, Rolando Cardenas, Enrique Lean. Uh, and uh, he says of Enrique Lean, uh, he was at that time 36 years old, is known throughout Latin America both as a poet and a short story writer. He writes in an idiom more difficult to translate than that of probably any other poet in Chile, except Neruda. Well, I, I mention that because 
I translated a selection of Enrique Lean's poems years later for host publications. It's over on the table there. And uh, I think he's a great poet. Uh, and his work really holds up. And then he did Efraín Barquero. And uh, finally, Nicanor Pavel. And he said, Potter of the best known in the United States, again, except for Neruda, of Chile's writers, grew up in a family of circus performers. I don't think that's true at all. His father was a, a math teacher in elementary, uh, and his mother was a seamstress. So I don't know where he got that, but anyway. He is now professor of higher mathematics at the University of Chile. His poems and anti-poems, published in 1954, fell on the world of Chilean letters the way Whitman's Leaves of Grass fell on ours 100 years ago. His work is iconoclastic, satirical, heretical, and funny, and built line by line with broken rules. It is the kind of poetry every literature needs at least once in a generation. Well, I read these poems, I just, like Emily Dickinson said, it just took the top of my head off, you know. I had never seen anything like this. Um, for instance, here's one, poetry ends with me. Did, did someone read that today, Joe? I don't Which say one? put an end to anything. Which one? I, I don't have any illusions about that. I wanted to keep on making poems, but the inspiration stopped. Poetry has acquitted itself well. I have conducted myself horribly. What do I gain by saying I have acquitted myself well? Poetry has conducted itself poorly when everyone knows I'm to blame. It's best that I be recognized as an imbecile. Poetry has acquitted itself well. I have conducted myself horribly. Poetry ends with me. Now, and I won't read all these, but uh, I just love these, uh, the end of this poem called Questions at Tea Time. Uh, we breathe a worn out atmosphere of ashes, smoke, and sadness. What was seen once does not come back the same, say the dry leaves. Tea time, toast and margarine in a kind of mist. So I made it known somehow among the group that I was in that I wanted to meet this poet. And fortunately, Greg Lip Lipscomb's friend, uh, Fran, uh, Fran, what was it? Spivey. Spivey, right. Fran Spivey heard me say this at some point. And <clears throat> a Chilean invited her to hear Nicanor Padra's sister, Violetta Padra, sing. Uh, in Santiago, and uh, I was talking with Ray uh, Hatch uh, about that, and he was saying he, he knows her song, uh, Gracias a la, vida, a la Vida, you know that? Uh, beautiful, beautiful song. Anyway, uh, so Fran was invited to go hear the, the uh, sister sing, and I guess at that point she discovered that she was the sister of this poet that I'd been talking about. So the guy said, oh, you know, another night I can also invite you to his house. And she said, well, could I invite a friend that's in our group? And he said, sure. So she told me, and I got to go and meet him. And it was, as I say, it was, it was life changing. He had just come back from Russia, where he had uh, put together an anthology of uh, Russian poets and worked with Russians in translating them. And uh, that book was published by uh, the University of Chile Press um, shortly after that, I, I believe. I don't remember the dates on that. So that's how I, I first met him. And uh, he was just wonderful and, and welcomed us into his home. My Spanish was almost non-existent. And, uh, but he spoke in English to us, uh, which was excellent. Uh, and I don't know how good his Russian was, but he had uh, certainly uh, picked up who were some of the great Russian poets and translated them with the help of other people, I assume. So after uh, I... Uh, uh, 
I visited him, uh, I wanted to get a hold of his latest book of poems, which was called Versos de Salon, but it was sold out. In Chile, and in Chile, uh, poetry books sell out within a year. I mean, here, you know, <laughs> it, it takes a, a lifetime, if, if even that. Uh, so people really, really buy uh, poetry in Chile, and certainly his work. Uh, well, a number of years later, <clears throat> uh, I was uh, teaching in uh, Illinois, and a, a Chilean who had, uh, in the meantime, I went back to Chile for a whole year uh, on my own, uh, all of 1966. And uh, I was teaching in a binational center in, in Santiago, and a poet from the South uh, in Valdivia, sort of a German settlement, um, came to the uh, institute where I was t uh, teaching and uh, uh, supposed to be editing a magazine, which I did do. Uh, and uh, I don't know how he found out about me, but he came and said that he would like, his university would like to invite me to Valdivia to give two lectures uh, on uh, American poetry. And I said, sure. So I went uh, there. And uh, so in 69, I think it was, I was in uh, Illinois, and uh, this uh, poet, who was actually studied law, uh, came to the Iowa Writers' Workshop. Uh, his name was Carlos Cortinas. And uh, while he was there, there was a magazine called Micromegas. Um, and it was edited by Frederick Will, who, when I was a student here, taught uh, in the Latin department, in the classics department. But he was now at uh, Iowa, and uh, he started this magazine. And so when Carlos showed up, I guess they got together, and he said, we need to have a, an issue on Chile. So uh, they did, and uh, Carlos Cortinas asked me to translate some poems. So. <clears throat> I don't remember if I chose them myself, but I think that uh, one of them, two, two of them for sure I did. This one uh, is by Padre, which I, I like a lot. Uh, you may know this one, uh, it's uh, called El Hombre. Uh, I just translated it as man. Uh, the mother of a man is gravely ill. He leaves in search of the doctor. He weeps. In the street, he sees his wife accompanied by another man. They are walking hand in hand. He follows them at a distance from tree to tree. He weeps. Now he meets a friend of his youth. It's been a coon's age since we saw each other. They come to a bar. They chat. They laugh. The man leaves to pee in the patio. He sees a young girl. It is night. She is washing the plates. The man comes close, takes her by the waist. They dance a waltz. Together they enter the street. There is an accident. The girl has lost consciousness. The man runs to find the phone. He weeps. He comes to a house with the lights on. He asks to use the phone. Someone recognizes him. Man, stay and eat. No, where is the telephone? Eat, man, eat. Afterwards you can go. The man sits down to eat. He drinks like one condemned. He laughs. They make him recite. He recites. He falls asleep beneath a writing bench. And in this same uh, issue, I translated some other poems. Uh, one, a sonnet by Neruda. Uh, and I was looking at it after all these years, I didn't even remember that I had translated that. I, I, I like it okay. Uh, but th this other one I found in a Chilean newspaper uh, at some point, I don't remember how. I've never seen it in any of his collections. And I really liked it. Uh, so since we're celebrating Chilean poetry, with your permission, I'll, I'll read this one. Uh, I, I like it because it's 
it shows how well Neruda could describe the Pacific Ocean. It's called Data for the Tidal Wave of July 25. The wave carried off in its fit all fences along the shore. Perhaps it was a sea dream, an eruption from the ocean depths. The truth is there are no words so rugged as is the wave. So many teeth here on the earth as in a passion come from sea. When the diadem rolls in and its bucklers begin to pour, the towers are then erected. When it gallops with feet and each enraged head beats upon the lightning stone, hold to God, my soul, the little fisherman mutters, pounding upon his dampened breast, to die without the pangs of the end. Twitching sea, bitter tortoise, armor of assassination, diapason of a fight to the death, piano of sanguinary fangs. Today you've destroyed my defenses with a petal of your fury. And like a, bat, a rattling bird, you sang on the hidden reefs. Here is the sea, say the eyes, yet one awaits a lifetime for living it unto death, and he awards you with a tempest with four granitic globs. A long point thunder I walked, taking the salt in my face, and from the sea in my mouth, the hurricane of its heart. I saw it rage far as the zenith, biting and spitting at the sky. In every gust he carried the armaments of a war, all of the tears of the world, and a train loaded down with lions. Yet not even this was enough, as he demolished all he had made, casting down on the rock a cold, cold rain of statues. O firmament of the reverse, O boiling stars of water, O tidal wave of rancor, I said, looking long at the beauty of all the unruly sea in a pitched battle against my nation, wracked by inexorable fear and sinister designs of the foam. Well, I, I didn't, uh, <clears throat> I didn't uh, concentrate on, uh, on uh, translating Padre, but. Uh